Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanna Massey-Lalikas, and I work with North Carolina Cooperative Extension through the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Welcome to this webinar, Growing Food, Growing Communities. We appreciate your being here today. Um, I work with Cooperative Extension's Local Foods flagship program here in North Carolina. Uh, I'll be moderating today, and we've got two great presenters, Lisa Valdivia and Don Bokelhide, who I'll be introducing shortly. Uh, we will be recording this webinar for future viewing. It'll be available about a month after we, uh, after we complete the webinar and caption it. And I'll give you that website in just a moment, but it's go.ncsu.edu forward slash local food lectures. A quick thank you to our sponsor, Southern SARE, has provided some funding to support this webinar today. This webinar is a component of a local foods graduate course that we're running for extension agents right now. Uh, we have pieces that are out there for professional development, such as this webinar, that we are extending out to uh, Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina extension agents. This project has been a collaboration, uh, including all of those listed here, as, and as well as many more. So I wanted to send a thank you out to our collaborators and cooperators for this, um, uh, for this overall project and giving input into the topics that include uh, the one that we're talking about today. So we have two presenters today, as I mentioned. Thank you, Lisa and Don, for coming on and sharing your expertise and experience with us. Uh, for those on the for the participants, I'll be introducing Lisa and Don. They'll present for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for your questions. I'll help to moderate those. Uh, so while they're speaking, if you want to type your questions in the chat box as we go, we'll get to those uh, uh, at the end of the presentation. So first, I'll start with Lisa. Lisa Valdivia is an Extension Associate with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Program at NC Agricultural and Technical State University. As Project Manager for the NCANT Community Gardens, Children, Youth, and Families at Risk, or SIFAR, Sustainable Communities Project from 2010 to 2014, she worked with several gardens in both rural and urban counties in North Carolina since their beginnings. She served as the first board chair and is now the Development Committee is on the development committee for the North Carolina Community Garden Partners, who you'll hear about later in this presentation. It's a nonprofit membership organization that's working to grow gardens, food, and community across the state. Don Bokelhide. Organic gardeners might recognize Don as the longtime national test gardener for Organic Gardening Magazine. He's also an active member of the American Community Gardening Association and a lead trainer for their growing community workshops, and as a board member of the North Carolina Community Garden Partners. Uh, a lifelong journalist, he writes a weekly column for the Charlotte Observer, mostly about food gardening, and his latest organic gardening, now organic life, article was on hot weather greens and the June-July 2014 issue. Uh, as a former Peace Corps agriculture volunteer in Togo, Tom Don holds an MS in agriculture from Cal Poly. He's trained in organic gardening at the Farallonis Institute. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Don. And has been a community gardener at Reedy Creek Park Community Garden in Charlotte since its founding in, 20, in uh, 2005. He, uh, he has added here he accepts the importance of organizing, but he loves the gardening part. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Lisa. Uh, Lisa, if you want to turn on your talk button, and we'll get started. All right, great. Thank you so much, jo Joanna, for the introduction. Before I start talking, everyone can hear me OK? Can I just get a thumbs up from someone to make sure that I'm, I'm on live? Yes, OK. Joanna says yes. So I will get started here. All right, so because of the nature of my work as a project coordinator and an extension associate working at the state level, I've spent a lot of time over the past few years looking from the outside in at community gardens, trying to understand their various nuances. But it wasn't always completely a rosy picture, right? So I've experienced weeding in the dead of the Carolina heat. I've served as a referee between bickering gardeners. I've dealt with the consequences of landlords who graciously volunteered their land and then decided to take it back a year later. 
And I've seen just how difficult it can be to help all gardeners feel ownership of this garden space. So, but, you know, I'll have to say, despite these many challenges, I still think that community gardens are pretty darn amazing. So community gardens help to address a whole host of things that you and I and communities care about, including food security, health disparities, and environmental issues. And in the process of building these gardens, people make connections and partnerships in the community that otherwise might have never even happened. People begin to realize the wealth of resources that they have right within their own communities. And they learn how to make lasting changes on their own, which really leads to even greater impacts down the road for those communities. As extension agents and community members interested in local food systems, you can play a vital role in helping community gardens bloom across our state. So this morning, Don and I are going to share some of our experiences working with community gardens in North Carolina and introduce you to some of the tools and ideas that we have found useful in working with community garden programs. In addition to our local level experience, we are also both part of an organization called the North Carolina Community Garden Partners that works to encourage and support community gardens on a statewide level, which Joanna already mentioned and we'll introduce you to a little bit more later on. We're hopeful that you can learn from our experiences and apply it to your own work with local food systems and that you'll leave here today understanding the power that community gardens have in creating positive changes within the community. So to keep us on a positive note, given that I'm sure many of us know of or can imagine plenty of challenges associated with starting and sustaining community gardens, I'd like to request that starting now and throughout this whole webinar, as things come to your mind, you type into the chat box the positive things that community gardens can do for our communities. So these might be either specific examples that you already know of because of your work with gardens or just ideas of what you think that community gardens could do for a community. And maybe at the end of this webinar, we can compile, compile them and send them out to you um, for you to read later as a reminder of why we do this important work. So go ahead and type things into the chat box now and, and throughout the whole presentation. Um, I also will just say now that most of my presentation is pictures, so as not to bore you with a lot of words. And a lot of them are from the projects that I've worked with in North Carolina. Um, and I'm definitely happy to share this text from my presentation afterwards, if that's helpful for anyone. I also wanted to just take a moment to thank all the people who are part of the project and are in these pictures, um, and also the people who took some of the pictures and shared them with me. OK, so community gardens are an important part of a healthy and sustainable food system. They come in all shapes and sizes and orientations, so a broad definition really works best here. A community garden is a place where a group of people garden together. Pretty simple. So under this broad heading, you'll find an enormous variety. Some are tiny collections of herbs and containers on an apartment balcony where people might be sharing. Others are huge expanses that they're using tractors. And then not all community gardens grow food. These are actually um, photos I took of community gardens in New York City where people were really just happy to rent a little piece of green space in the city to rest and relax in outside. So since this is a food system class, though, we're going to focus on community gardens that grow food. And that said, don't forget the flowers. The pollinators need to eat, too. But um, just looking at food gardens, there is a fundamental division between gardens that provide space for individuals or families to grow a garden of their own, which we call a plot garden, and gardens that manage their entire space collectively as a single group or a communal garden. So food produced in plot gardens is most commonly used for, for personal use, and each gardener or family can choose what they want to grow in their own plot. And then a communal garden 
Um, you know, the harvest may be split among the gardeners. It may be based on shares or hours worked. Or m more often, it may be donated to organizations that distribute food to those in need. And these types of gardens are, are really seeming to grow in popularity in North Carolina, at least, especially among the faith groups and food pantries, where people are donating the food to the, to the pantries. So either of these two general models can be modified to focus on a particular need or purpose. So for example, horticulture therapy gardens may provide accessible small plots where individuals with physical challenges can enjoy gardening. And maybe a, a communal garden may focus on youth who sell their produce at a local farmer's market, or a school garden that uses the space for educational purposes. Or both models may actually be combined in one garden where you have plots in the garden and you also have a communal garden space. The point is that community garden variety is really endless. So before, you know, before even determining though what or how a community garden is physically structured, uh, extension and other supporters often need to help gardeners and garden organizers really hone in on the garden's goals develop a mission statement and talk about the values of the group so that everyone is on the same page, right? It's a good idea to make a plan before, it's a good idea to make a plan for the garden before you even break ground. And there are many existing documents that I'll point to you later on that are going to help you, um, you know, think about some of the important questions to ask when you're trying to organize or in some cases reorganize a garden. So as extension agents, you can provide an invaluable service by translating tools like logic models that you are likely familiar with using to terms and applications that community gardeners can understand and use to improve their overall effectiveness and sustainability as a group. Right? So when people come to you asking for advice in starting a new community garden, you can help them determine what their goals will be, what success is going to look like for their group, and what the project will be and what it won't be. Because it can't really be everything, even though some people want it to be that. Um, at least it can't be that at the beginning. Which also reminds me to tell you one of the key points of community gardens is to start small, be successful, and then build from there. So, so back to kind of making a plan. Um, for example, if the group identifies that one of their main goals is to sell produce from the garden, you know that you'll need to help them think about creating a business plan for that and developing skills in financial management and marketing. And this garden or market garden is going to be very, very different from a garden plan where people just want to grow food for donation or for, um, you know, to give to a food pantry. And so since community gardens can be so many different things, helping people stay focused on something that is manageable can really be a challenge. It is, is really true that community gardens can accomplish a lot of different things. And an obvious one for local food systems is making fresh food available, often where it is needed most. But food is not the only harvest from a community garden. Community gardens also cultivate a deeper sense of community. And most of the time, this community organizing element gets people talking about bringing people together and strengthening neighborhoods, singing kumbaya, and all of that makes sense, right? Um, but I'd say that, you know, anybody who starts or works closely with community gardens really becomes a community organizer by default. So like it or not, you can add this title to the long list of things that you already do as an agent. And maybe this is because, you know, in part because community gardens, even tiny ones, can create a unique kind of space for people to gather. Right, the transformation can be stunning, from a blighted lot full of trash and discarded refrigerators and kudzu, to a delightful garden filled with food and flowers and laughing children. And this shared space for horticulture in our urban, suburban, and rural communities is a unique element in green space. And it's unique because it includes food. So for extension agents, and others working with local foods, this helps make community gardens like a new version of the village green, an ideal place, an ideal place you know, to help people connect with local foods and food security in a hands-on setting. 
being part of a community garden engages people directly in the food system as growers, and therefore they know more and they care more about the food system as a whole. Okay, so instead of talking in kind of abstract terms, let me share some concrete achievements and examples from the community garden project that I worked on from um, the 2009 to 2014. All right, so we helped communities develop community gardens in three different counties in North Carolina. Our plan was to give families access to better food. And two communities decided to make gardens that rented out plots. And then one community was a church, and they decided they would make a communal garden. The community garden that we helped start in Scotland County spurred a lot of school gardens within the same area. And it also provided a place for a group of young men in the juvenile justice system to have a life-changing experience growing in the garden, both physically and metaphorically speaking. And education was absolutely essential in the garden. Opportunities were provided both in the classroom and in the garden, and I would encourage anyone working with community gardens to, to do the same thing. Over 100 partnership, partnerships were established with organizations, universities, governments, you know, the list really goes on and on. And I really can't emphasize enough how important forming partnerships is to the success of community gardens. We also received over $100,000 in grants and in-kind donations over the life of the project. And although a garden may not be able to exist alone on in-kind donations, I will say that they can really help reduce the cost of gardening. So always keep that in mind. Um, volunteer labor in our gardens helped build fences, weed common areas, and grow food for donations. And then, so these are some of the results that we saw based on surveys and interviews we did with the garden participants. So gardens increased access to healthy, affordable food for people. They increased fruit and vegetable consumption among the gardeners. The gardeners were encouraged to try new foods, and they did so. Families saved money because they were growing their own food and preserving the food to have it when it was out of season, so they didn't have to buy it in the store. And community members met each other and new relationships were formed. There was also an increased sense of community and camaraderie, and almost every person said that as a result of the garden, they felt more involved in their community. So this project also helped us to accomplish one of the action items in the Center for Environmental Farming Systems Farm to Fork Initiative, which aimed to create a sustainable local food economy across North Carolina. And that action item was to cultivate community gardens statewide. And we did this by helping to create a statewide network for community gardens, the North Carolina Community Garden Partners. So working with this project, I was in a position equivalent to you in many ways. I wasn't a member of the garden, and I didn't do much digging in the dirt, and that, that wasn't my job, even if I secretly wanted it to be. But I think my role and yours, if you choose to accept it, was very, very important. I was there to help groups organize um, effectively, um, to forge partnerships, and to find the resources they need in their communities. And I was able to listen supportively, helped facilitate discussions, and give gardeners and garden managers someone who could listen fairly and objectively. So based on our experience with this project, here are some of the most important lessons that we learned. And we, I mean me, and also some of the garden managers that I worked with throughout the project. The first thing is to always ask, does this community or, you know, the community in question actually want a garden? And is there wide support for the project now, as well as a plan to keep up the support for the project later on? Don't do for others 
see what they can do for themselves. Always engage and empower gardeners in the larger community at every stage of your project from the very, very beginning. Even if it takes more time, because I know it's going to, um, it will be worth it in the end. If you build it, they may not come. The idea here is don't build a community garden for the community, build it with the community. Paid garden managers are great, but they are not always realistic. So make sure at the beginning you're thinking about who is going to lead the effort, and hopefully that number is going to be greater than one. Gardens break down barriers to fruit and veggie consumption by increasing access to the foods, decreasing cost of foods for families, and increasing the acceptance of eating fruits and veggies because when people grow it, they are more likely to eat it. And it is imperative to have strong support from your county director and several agents is very helpful in your office if your county extension plans to sponsor a community garden. All right, and to wrap up, I. Um, my part of the presentation at least, I will just say that community gardens are a lot of hard work, but they are definitely worth it in the end. Um, before I pass this off to Don for a little bit, I just wanted to real quickly say thank you to the people who helped to make this project possible, um, specialists at a and State University, Keith Baldwin and Michelle Ely, and then the people in the communities that we worked with, Sharon English, um, Melissa Tomas and Sarah Brown in Scotland County, Michelle Wallace in Santos Flores in Durham County, James Peel in Berkey County, and of course all of these great community gardeners who helped make these, these gardens a great success. So I think I do see that there are questions coming in. I think I'm going to pass it off to Don though right now and we will have some time for questions at the very end. All right, thank you everyone. Lisa? Um, I just see there's just still two yeah. questions there from one person. If you want to go ahead and answer that, I think we're good on time. So the oh, question okay. is, are there exceptions to who builds when your target community is older and has mobility issues? And a follow-up question, the builders may be different community members from the target gardeners, right? The exceptions to who builds when your target community is older and has mobility issues. Um, well, I mean, I would, I would definitely say that's a, that's a type of situation where you're going to want to involve volunteers, right? So you might partner up with a youth group or, um, you know, we did some work with Home Depot in our community who actually, you know, gave us money for the garden materials, but then also sent out a huge workforce, people of all ages, from the company that helped to physically build the garden. Um, so obviously in, in that case, there's going to be some things that um, the, the, the actual gardeners won't be able to do themselves, but I would say that's a great opportunity to involve other partners in your community and get, you know, more than just the gardeners involved in the creation. So that's the, that's the whole community part of it. Um, and you say the builders may be different community members from the target gardeners, right? Yes, I would. I would agree that that can definitely be the case in gardens. Great. Thanks, Lisa. We'll hold the other questions until the end. And Don, if you want to hit your talk button, and Lisa, if you'll turn yours off, uh, we'll carry on. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. That was a, that was a terrific presentation. We may have a little technical issue. Can everyone see the first slide? Great. Don, I just forwarded it, it, so we'll need to. You'll need to let me know when to move it forward. <laughs> okay, I'll try to do that. Um, and those are wonderful questions. Um, so yes, that is Jenna. Uh, when I worked with the Peace Corps, I visited Jenna, which is in Mali. It's a magical place on the banks of the Bonnie River, which is in the midst of the dusty, arid Sahel. 
And it's best known for that grand mosque that you see in front of you, with the fanciful minarets. Always make me think of Gaudi's Cathedral in Barcelona. And these gigantic earrings of beaten gold that women wear in the marketplace. But being an Aggie type, there was something else that was beautiful that caught my eye. Around the edges of the town, outside the city walls, people were growing vegetable gardens. This is true throughout West Africa. And one stood out from the rest. He had really tall okra and very healthy stands of millet and black-eyed peas and somehow or other carrots out there in the desert. And what made the difference? Show that slide. Do you see it? It was a bicycle pump. Not like the type that you um, pump up the tire with, but a way that a farmer had rigged up his bike so it could power a simple water pump. And gas was really expensive and the supply was unreliable. So this gardener had improvised using what Peace Corps volunteers like to call appropriate technology. That uses simplicity and creativity and ingenuity to make the world a better place and a less hungry place. You know, next slide. Appropriate, community gardens are another example of appropriate technology. They're simple, but they're able to make a positive impact on complex local food systems like you've been learning about. With a little ingenuity and vision and a lot of hard work, community gardeners can increase the availability of fresh, high-quality vegetables, just like one of you was saying in the chat box, right where they're needed the most. Next slide. To be most effective, though, appropriate technologies need a modest but consistent level of support, and that's where you guys come in. Because as extension agents, you can make a major contribution to sustaining healthy community gardens and increasing food gardening opportunities for North Carolinians. And I've seen extensions contributions in my own community garden. And I'm really excited to have this chance today to share a few practical ideas for working effectively with community gardens, uh, building on what Lisa shared already. Next slide. Um, I'm Don Bokelhide, and I'm speaking to you as a community gardener. And exactly the kind of person who you might be working with someday. Slide. My home community garden at Reedy Creek Park near UNC Charlotte turned 10 years old this year. We started small, but today we've got 76 plots, most of them 20 by 20, on an acre of land. And when I started organizing the garden back in 2004, I had no idea I'd still be gardening there a decade later with some people that have become very good friends. Slide. Like all community gardeners, I wear other hats. That's my front yard. Um, I write for the Charlotte Observer and Organic Gardening's website. It's no longer a magazine. My wife and I live near the university where she's on the faculty. We have a couple of kids in college, a couple of mischievous dogs, a mortgage, a yard to maintain. And then complains I'm always sneaking off to the community garden, which is about a mile away, to work over there. Next slide. Our garden is located on public parkland, and it's sited there to provide some measure of land tenure security, something Lisa talked about uh, briefly. In Mecklenburg County, it's interesting, cooperative extension is treated as a division of the Park and Recreation Department. So extension personnel have acted as our unofficial landlords and advisors since our garden got started. And we've worked with a series of extension directors and agents, and we've benefited greatly from the resources and ideas that they've shared. Slide. So since you guys in Extension have been really good to me in my garden, I've decided to present you with something in return, a wish list. But don't worry, I'm not going to ask you for stuff. I mean, that never happens with Extension agents, right? People don't like want stuff from you. Instead, what I'm going to do is share a different kind of wish list. A couple of things that I wish I'd have known or thought of before I started working with community gardens. And you may hear some of the same ideas that Lisa has because they are really important. Slide. 
before I begin, I want to warn you. Watch out. Community gardens are really rewarding and a lot of fun. And if you're not careful, you're going to end up like me, hooked up on community gardening and enjoying it immensely. So the first thing I wish I would have thought of or realized is that, green gar that community gardens are part of a community's green infrastructure. And somebody mentioned this in the chat box too. They go along with open space and greenways and parks and public landscaping and all the similar elements that you find in urban design. But they occupy a unique and vital niche as an environmental asset because they include food production as an important goal. Slide. Some people call community gardens the new village green, a place where people meet informally and make friends and celebrate together. At Reedy Creek Park, for example, an informal Sunday brunch is now a ritual. People of all ages and shapes and colors and sizes gather to laugh and eat potluck muffins and solve the world's problems. And I wish I under, had understood the importance of things other than food growing for healthy gardens. They are really, really important. Uh, in fact, at UNC Charlotte's garden, the social element may be the most important thing that's going on. They put up some hammocks there, and they're never empty. I go over to like check the water and stuff like that. There are always students there. And no doubt, they're more popular than like the fresh spinach and turnips that we're growing, but not by much. Both are important. There's an academic superstar who helped launch the garden who had never seen a turnip. This is true. And now he loves them. The kind he likes are the hakuris. Do you know those? The little tiny sweet Japanese gourmet type. Community gardens, it turns out, are very, very popular as gathering places. There's some research out of Sacramento, California that found that a community garden was actually more popular there as a community gathering place and visual asset than a conventional keep off the grass kind of landscaped park right next door. Slide. For me, though, the deep appeal of community gardening is not simply about, you know, food. It is about food. It's not simply about the social and visual elements, too. I'm constantly reminding the kids at the garden about that. I wish I had understood that community food gardens, whether they're managed as individual plots or group gardens, are so much like home vegetable gardens. Put really simply, community gardens offer a place to garden for anybody who wants to grow food. And this may help clarify, it has in our county, one key educational role that it agents and master gardeners can play, because there's really no difference between explaining the best ways to grow tomatoes to a home gardener or to a community gardener. And I want you to, as they say in the old VW ad, think small. I wish everybody could think small especially when they're first getting their garden started. In the end, if you end up with a nicely maintained little garden, that's a much better outcome than a vast garden that's a big, weedy mess. At Reedy Creek, for example, we started with 22 plots, then doubled in size about three years later when demand increased, and we got much better through trial and error running the garden. Then we expanded again to our present size after another three years. And I'm sure that if we had tried to start at full size in the beginning, we might have gotten great headlines and press, but we easily could have failed. Slide. One thing that's very important to remember is that you, you're learning some great tools, about some great tools and resources in community garden organizing. Uh, very often there are all these, you, you might be doing some later this afternoon. Uh, you write lists of rules, you do garden vision statements, you do goals, the list goes on and on. They're all standard operating procedure for nonprofit organizations and community organizers. 
But I wish I would have understood that you don't just do that once. You do it over and over again. It's just like maintaining the garden. It's not a one-shot deal. And especially important, I think, are practicing democracy and perfecting inclusion. They're very challenging. And, you know, I think if any of us think this kind of work is easy, all we need to do is take a quick look right now at Raleigh, Washington, D.C. It's hard to make decisions together. Laura Lawson, who's a, uh, I think, the scholar of, of the day in terms of community gardening history in the United States, feels that garden programs need to stay flexible. They need, you're not going to do all your work in the beginning. So the participants can change them to better fit evolving needs in the garden. I wish I would have understood a new slide that it takes a year on the average from bright idea to garden gate opening. That was the case at Reedy Creek. It took us a good full year plus. That recently opened Student Community Garden UNC Charlotte took over two years. And that's with even some very highly capable young people enthusiastically working on its behalf. New slide. Looking back over a century, Dr. Lawson identified six general areas where community gardens made indisputable contributions. Foods at the top of the list, but also recreation, and that's healthful recreation, education, economic opportunity, community activism, and environmental restoration. Slide. I'd add one more. It's the power to transform people in unexpected ways. The example that comes to mind for me is from my years at the Charlotte Urban Ministry Center, where I was blessed to be able to direct a community gardening program specifically for people who were homeless. Now, you talk about people that need garden space. It was an interesting job for sure. Turned out that a lot of homeless folks are crackerjack gardeners who've grown up on farms. We did have a terrible problem with theft from the garden, but we solved it pretty easily by planting some crops outside the garden as a UPEC area, free for the taking. Problem disappeared. In fact, in the end, our worst problem wasn't with the homeless, but with middle class soup kitchen volunteers who would ignore the beautiful fresh organic lettuce and broccoli that we were growing and serve peanut butter sandwiches and canned soup instead. We finally had to take volunteers and neighbors, that's what we call the homeless folks, into the kitchen if we wanted to eat our own produce. Slide. That was our bottle tree, by the way, that you were looking at. There's one young man I'm never going to forget who had bright red hair and a lot of missing teeth who hung out at the center dragging along a battered guitar. And he would have absolutely nothing to do with the counseling staff, though he, he looked like he needed a friend bad. He never spoke to anyone. At some point, he began loitering around the garden. You can see the garden there, and people just come and work and stuff. And he never helped. He never talked. But one day, as I was suckling tomatoes, I heard this little soft voice singing to this out-of-tune guitar, and it was him. After a few days, he did begin talking this long, disjointed story about his family and a girlfriend. But he still wouldn't talk to people. He told everything to the tomatoes. And eventually, we got him to go inside and get help. But when that garden and those therapeutic tomatoes reached out to this hurting soul and counselors couldn't, that made a big impact on me. Community gardens are capable of deep transformation. Slide. That said, back to uh, Dr. Lawson for all their value. She cautions against proposing community gardens as a panacea for all of society's ills. I wish I'd realized that because I was really enthusiastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm an enthusiastic kind of guy. Unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, though, she points out mean policymakers may ignore the valuable contributions that gardens actually make. Um, she puts it this way, new slide, a community garden can't simply single-handedly stop drug sales 
or the lack of public services to maintain lots in poor, fragile neighborhoods. They do a lot, but we have to be really clear about what we want the garden to do and what they're really capable of doing. Slide. Lisa talked about this, and I think it jumps out at, you know, as I look at so many training materials. A key role that you as an organizer can play is translator. And, and I don't mean like speaking Spanish or Mandarin or Hmong. That's really helpful too. But it's to bridge that gap between gardeners and community organizers and funding and support organizations. All three are different. All three have different agendas. Extension often has a different agenda. And if a funding agency or organizers start talking about the logic model or collective impact or food value chain or ABCD, you name it, gardeners may have no earthly idea what any of these mean. In fact, I know this because I just asked my fellow gardeners at Reedy Creek, many of whom have advanced degrees, if they knew any of these things. No, what they wanted to talk about was, you guessed it, when to harvest sugar snap peas as the heat goes up, what to do about nut sedge, how to stop Joe in plot six from spraying Roundup on their corn. So you can be translators, slide, and you can also make sure that people who are, you know, who are going to be in the garden are part, a meaningful part of things. If other people come in to build stuff, and of course, gardens don't have to have boxes. That's popular right now, but it's not necessary. The plants don't care, as all we horticulturists know. But in a meaningful way, people who are going to have a garden need to be part of that garden as much as possible. Um, one thing you may work with are, slide, Garden superheroes. Uh, they're also called super volunteers. They're the kind of person who does everything and basically runs a garden. And in some cases, maybe many cases, the garden just wouldn't exist without them. So I'm always respectful. But I'm also always looking for ways for others to step in to some of those roles. You're actually doing that super volunteer a favor. And you're also going to be increasing the organizational capacity of the garden to survive without the resident superhero. I wish I'd thought about that. Slide. Um, looking at the history of community gardening, it's clear that rationales and champions and funders and political support and headlines and hype all come and go, and they change from decade to decade. But gardens ought to remain more than they do. Community gardens in the states, unfortunately, haven't become, there's a slide in there, community gardens ought to be permanent. They haven't been protected the way they are in Europe. But they keep popping up. They're like dandelions. One day, let's hope that they get the respect and protection they deserve as valuable, permanent parts of landscapes. Slide. But the most important thing for you guys, I think, to work with as agents are the gardeners. They never go away. And so always put them first. It's the gardeners, not the organizers, not the funders, not the media, not the big institutions who matter worse. That toothless teen who could only talk to the tomatoes, the college kid with astronomical SATs who'd never seen a turnip, the astoundingly diverse crowd that gathers around the picnic table at Reedy Creek and shares laughter and wisdom and fresh veggies. Slide. So what gardeners want? is a place at the shared table that we're all calling the local food system. It's an empowered place where they can participate directly, if only in a small way, in growing their own nutritious food. Slide. So I'm going to close quickly with a challenge. It's this. You're all doing great work in extension. I really want to thank you for it. And I realize that local food systems are much, much larger than just community gardens and community gardeners. Dr. Sullivan showed that to you. The food systems become global, for better or worse, and it's enormously complex. But knowing that, I challenge you to never forget the gardeners and to join us in NCCGP as we work to establish community gardens across North Carolina so that every single person in our state who wants to grow some food can do it.
So thanks very much. I'm going to return the mic to Lisa so she can tell us tell you more about NCCGP. And I hope you'll join us. Thanks, Don. All right. Lisa? Sure. Thanks, Don and Joanna. Um, I am super energized after hearing Don speak, so I hope you all are as well. Um, just a few quick notes before we go to questions. Uh, one major lesson is that we do not need to reinvent the turnip. There are a wealth of excellent resources out there for you already um, as an extension professional and also for the gardeners and the organizers that you work with. Organizations like Cooperative Extension obviously um, have great materials. Also the American Community Gardening Association known um, in brief as ACGA who is now based in Atlanta can help provide easy access to high quality materials which are based on best practices, research and practical experience. So these are some of the links here for those organizations. Also in keeping with our local theme the place that I hope you'll start with is your, um, at least for those of you who are in North Carolina, is the North Carolina um, Community Garden Partners. We hope you'll become a dues paid member of it. You'll be a growing and um, part of a growing and effective network of people working in community gardens across the state. We have a lot of support from Extension. In fact, I'd say the, this organization grew out of Extension and we have several agents and other folks who are um, working with Cooperative Extension in North Carolina that are a part of this group and support us. Uh, we have an annual day-long gathering held in different parts of the state. We try to move it around and this is a unique opportunity to make friends and share ideas with other community gardeners. This is the web page here so you're welcome to visit and learn more about the organization. Oh and one thing I just wanted to mention too um, we are gathering kind of a, a list or a map of community gardens across the state and that helps not only us connect with the community gardens but it helps other gardeners find community gardens in their local areas. So take a look at that. This is one thing I wanted to point out in terms of resources. Um, there's, there's a lot on the extension website which I gave you on the previous slide. This is the resource list with the North Carolina Community Garden Partners. And if you are just trying to figure out how to start a garden with some people in your community, um, they've you know, come to you and, and are interested in doing this and want your help, um, there's a, a place where you can go there to some guides that show you kind of the basic steps in starting a garden. There's some from North Carolina. There's some from other states that are really great resources. So I encourage you to check those out. And then I'll just say, um, Joanne already mentioned that um, NCCGP is a membership organization. It's also now a nonprofit organization. One of the things that we've done this last year with the group is to organize these GROW workshops. And these were targeted at limited resource and minority community garden leaders across North Carolina. Um, last year, these workshops reached 122 people from 28 different counties representing 48 community gardens. We had really uh, great feedback from these workshops. People were very excited about them and they had a, a wonderful opportunity to network with others and learn from people in their communities which I'll say is I think one of the most important things. People um, you know, really like to be able to talk with others about the challenges that they're facing in their community gardens and share how they were able to solve those challenges. And so the garden tours that we did as part of these workshops um, helped people to connect each other. We also provided some mini grants um, to the people who attended the workshops so that they could implement the techniques that they learned during the workshops back at home in their community gardens. So that is uh, a little bit about NCCGP. I think that is the end of our slides. I don't know, Don, if you had anything to add. Um, or Joanna, if you wanted to go on to questions at this point. I think questions are a great idea. I mean, the wonderful observations coming up in the chat box. Sounds great in Gaston County. The network? Yeah, so I'm hoping to see some more ideas come into the chat box. Um, I have a couple of questions from earlier on. One, Lisa, that came at the end of uh, your session. 
uh, did the idea for the gardens come from dedicated community members or from the extension office? Right, great. I, and I saw Emily wrote that. Um, great, great question. And we actually, I, I had wanted to go more into this in the presentation, but with limited time, um, we didn't discuss that. But so there's kind of two different models that we generally think of, right, when starting a community garden. It can really start from the bottom up and kind of a grassroots effort where you have local community people with this idea to create a garden, and then they go out searching for who's going to help them accomplish that. And then you might have a, a, a different type of model, which we would call more top-down, where you have a, a, an organization more at a state or a national level even that is um, promoting something and kind of trying to get people to grab onto the idea. Um, and both work very, very differently and definitely have their, their pluses and minuses. The project I worked with came uh, from a, a USDA grant, right? So extension at the state level applied for it. Um, and when we were awarded the grant, um, you know, we had already connected with county offices and agents who were interested in the idea of community gardens. So to answer your question directly, it did come from the extension office. I will say, um, you know, we, we, we could have definitely done better. And when I look back at some of the, um, how we started the gardens in terms of involving the community. But one example I'll say was a, a good one is, one of our communities did a lot of work before even breaking ground in the garden to go out and survey the community around where the garden was going to be and ask them if this was going to be useful for them, if they wanted a garden, if they would garden there, how much they would pay, et cetera, et cetera. And start building up um, support for the garden. And they also did a great job of, you know, again, involving people from the very beginning with actually helping to, to build the physical garden. Um, and some of those people stayed with the garden to this day. So there's there's a lot more to talk about with that, but I know we have a lot of other questions. So I would add one thing, and that is to really listen. Um, top down can work. Sometimes you have to step in when, let's say, people who they're just learning how to do democratic process with one another. And they think, oh, I'm now in charge of the garden. I'm going to take six plots for myself. Or I'm going to just, we're just going to grow sweet corn because that's all I want to grow. You may need to do some modeling. Um, you, you, top, down, top down has its place in some situations, as long as it's a tool for empowerment. What you don't want to do is be encouraging dependency, because those gardens won't be sustainable. Yes, I completely agree. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Great answers there. You wanna, uh, there was a question. There was a question, Don, about what the water source was in Jenna where uh, they were using the bicycle pump. It was water from the river, but it was flowing underneath the surface of what looked like a dry riverbed for much of the year. So they were shallow Great. tube wells. Great, thanks. There's, and I think about there was two or three months of the year, um, just trivia, two or three months of the year, the water actually flows enough that you can take boats back and forth between Jenna and the next town up the river, which is also very picturesque, called Mopti. Great, that sounds like an amazing opportunity to see all of that, Don. It's so there was a question, Don. I, I'm sorry. No, no, there ahead. was a question, Don, about what were the kind, of, what was the kind of wood for the timbers, and I saw you responded to it in the chat box, mm -hmm. um, and that was regarding the garden that had the large brick building in the background. Um, Don, do you wanna, you wanna yes. share what you wrote in the I chat box? I believe that it, that was talking about the UNC Charlotte garden. That would be the one with the big brick building, because yeah. we don't have. It's interesting, at Reedy Creek, which is a large plot type garden, the original extension agent we worked with, Jim Monroe, banned all kinds of boxes. He was thinking like a farmer. Farmers don't put down boxes. They get in your way. Um, they're more of a horticultural thing. I, I want to call them planters rather than raised beds. The idea of a raised bed is you're raising it above the level of the surrounding soil. That's a great idea here for encouraging drainage. But 
a boxed planter of some kind, he banned them. As soon as he left, though, people started making them. People loved to make stuff. Over at UNC Charlotte, somebody got a big grant to spend a lot of money and make boxes. Making something is very satisfying, and that's part of the appeal of community gardening. The build-out day is a big deal, and everybody shows up. But that's not what interests me. What interests me is a year or two later. Is that garden still there? And is it strong? Right. And is it building? Is it building food security? Is it building the ability of people to take some uh, ownership over their own communities, make decisions for themselves? Great point, Don. Thank you. Uh, and we have the comment and question from David Fogarty in Gaston County. We have five new independent community gardens in Gaston County. At Cooperative Extension, we are organizing a county community garden network to support these efforts. Are you familiar with such network efforts in your communities? On what roles uh, do they most and what roles do they most effectively play? And how could our county network best collaborate with North Carolina community garden partners? Great. Thanks, David. I'll, I'll jump in here real quick with an answer, and then Don, you're welcome to add, of course. Um, definitely familiar with some of the regional networks um, across North Carolina and actually across the, the country. I would say they're, they're much more um, prevalent than our statewide networks. So within North Carolina, for example, you know, there's, um, we know there's a network in Forsyth County. Um, there's one in Wake County. There's one in other counties that I'm forgetting right now. But those um, regional programs, a lot of them are, for example, um, keeping lists of gardens that exist within their community. Um, that way, when people contact the Extension Office, they might be looking for a place to garden. And the Extension Office can, tell, you know, can give them the names of some gardens that might have open spaces, for example. I know some programs, uh, some Extension Offices, that are offering educational opportunities for gardens, which is a huge thing. They do classes that are specifically um, geared towards community gardens. Some of them are doing mentoring programs where they're training people from the community to help um, mentor at a specific community garden. Right? So they teach those mentors um, you know, horticulture, they teach them about these organizing principles that we've talked about today, and then those mentors are assigned to individual gardens and are able to help them uh, work through some of the, the processes they need to be successful. So I, I think those are just in general some of the things I know that regional or local level networks are doing. Um, one of the ways that, um, just on a very basic level, that you can see where some of those networks in North Carolina are. If you go on that map I had showed earlier, not only are there uh, points for individual gardens, but there's also points to connect with organizations. And those are in the, the purple carrots on, on the map. Um, and David, I'd actually be interested in talking with you maybe a little bit after, because I know we're running short on time, about how you can best network with um, NCCGP. But we are, we're definitely interested in that. And we know there's a lot of uh, important work that is already being done at a local and regional level. And so we want to we want to build on that and help those networks grow and help other networks in communities that don't have them grow as well. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, great response. I appreciate that. I think we answered Julie Flowers' question about community garden networks best connecting. Uh, there's some conversation here about uh, gardeners with limited mobility and the need for accessible beds. And Don responded that uh, accessible beds are a great idea and not to be in every garden. So uh, I wanted to ask the group. We've got folks from Virginia and South Carolina with us. Do you all have uh, a statewide network of community gardens in, in your state? Uh, it would be great to know that. And if so, if you have a website, you can share. That would be great in the chat box. OK. Not seeing anything uh, okay. new come in. Go ahead, Don. I was going to say there's a very active, supportive program around uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Some very good stuff going on there. Clemson's got some very good things happening. Um, they do. I know that situation. And in fact, they've cooperated with NCCGP, haven't they, uh, Lisa? 
anyway, we had, um, I don't know as much about Virginia. The Virginia Association for Biological Agriculture is a great technical resource, and there's some tremendous stuff up there. Um, uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, Twin Oaks, um, lots of really good stuff. And so I'm guessing that there probably is some very good community garden organizing going on as well. I'd love to hear about it. Yes, I know the work is going on, and I um, was just curious about the networking. And you all are doing amazing things in both Virginia and South Carolina. We're so glad to have you here on the webinar. And we'll look forward to opportunities that we can hear from you all in the future. And we're out of time at this point. We're a minute over. I apologize for that. But thank you all for coming and joining us. Dawn and Lisa, you leave me very inspired and uh, more knowledgeable about the work that you all have done and community gardens generally. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, one last thing, too. There's another webinar coming up. Uh, in June, Role of Extension Agents in Local Food Systems, Distinguishing Government Policy and Law. So watch the website listed here uh, for more information, and we'll, we'll send out information on that and registration uh, as we get closer through the same routes we have for this one. Thank you. Bye-bye.